Greetings everyone. My name is Dr. Jason Freeman. I'd like to welcome you all to my channel. In this video, I tell you about five kingdoms created by African slaves that you likely never heard of. Now at any point, feel free to click the notification bell or subscribe to my channel to get more content. So without further ado, let's begin. trying to do in my teaching as well as in these videos I've been posting on YouTube which are just an extension of my teaching is to try to push back against the narrative that historically Africans have just passively accepted oppression whether that oppression be in the form of slavery apartheid type laws like you saw in the American South um, with Jim Crow segregation or you know mass incarceration in places like United States or Brazil. And we've seen images of people of African descent passively accepting oppression in films like Song of the South and Gone with the Wind. And even the 2012 film Lincoln, you see the contribution of people of African descent in the emancipation of slaves uh, largely excluded. Nevertheless, I mean, a lot of examples of people of African descent uh, who fought back against oppression. And in the case of the Creole, um, actually succeeded. And so in this video, I'm going to kind of build on the idea of black people fighting back against oppression and succeeding by telling you all about five kingdoms established by African slaves that you probably never heard of. Now, the first kingdom I want to talk about is uh, the kingdom of Nanny Town in Jamaica. Now, some of the most famous maroon communities in the world um, are the maroon communities of Jamaica. They were even referenced in the 2014 film uh, from Chris Rock, uh, Top Five. Uh, I was just in meetings. Oh, hey, Andre Allen. Hey, white bread. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you, man. I cannot wait to see the movie. I'm so glad somebody's finally telling Bookman's story. I mean, no one talks about the maroon slaves. I know, they're so overlooked. It's crazy. It's crazy. But you probably never heard the name Queen Nanny. The Queen Nani was the name of the leader of the Windward Maroons who inhabited the eastern region of Jamaica. Now, it's believed that she was born in Ghana in the 1680s and ruled as a Khan Queen or Queen Mother from 1725 to 1740. The Queen Nani actually created two kingdoms. The old Nani town was a village in the Blue Mountains of Jamaica, the longest mountain range within the country. Now, the inhabitants of Nanny Town mainly included the descendants of former slaves who had escaped first the Spanish uh, occupiers of the island, and then later on you had slaves who had escaped the British um, and their descendants who uh, helped, again, help create Nanny Town. Uh, and then you also had members of the Taino native peoples um, who uh, had already inhabited uh, Jamaica prior to uh, European colonization. Nanny Town was well defended. It was actually um, positioned at the highest point within the Blue Mountains, uh, which made surprise attack almost impossible. It overlooked a river, uh, which again made it um, partially inaccessible to uh, troops who tried to invade. It was guarded by armed sentinels, um, basically uh, African and African descendant guards who would communicate with each other using what's called an abang, which is a side-blown flute. Um, and uh, it, they utilized guerrilla warfare whenever people did attack, um, which was able to easily repel uh, traditional British forces. The inhabitants of Nanny Town successfully raided plantations throughout Jamaica. They would free slaves and also steal weapons. At the same time, they grew crops and raised animals. They actually traded on the coast for things like clothing and weapons. Now, after several consecutive successful raids by the inhabitants of Nanny Town, British authorities decided in 1730 to ultimately try to destroy the community. Between 1730 and 1734, Nanny Town withstood multiple direct attacks by the British militia. Also during that time, the British athlete which was trying to kill Queen Nanny. In 1734, Nanny Town was finally abandoned, though Queen Nanny and many of her followers uh, remained free. 
New Nanny Town, also known as Moore Town, was established in 1740 after Queen Nanny and her Windward Maroons signed a truce with the British. Now, with the truce, they were granted 500 acres of land. Moore Town, which again was originally New Nanny Town, still exists today in Jamaica and still uh, has some level of sovereignty from the Jamaican government. In 1975, Queen Nanny was declared a national hero of Jamaica and the $500 note, um, also known as the Nanny, um, has the image of Queen Nanny on it. Now, the second kingdom I wanna talk about is the Kingdom of Palmeiras in Brazil. Hey guys, so as I was editing the video, I realized that I was saying Palmeiras incorrectly. I was saying Palmeiras. So it's Palmeiras <laughs> um, in Portuguese. Um, so while the pronunciation is wrong, trust me, the information is good. Now, the Kingdom of Palmeiras existed between 1630 and 1694 in the Quilombo region of Brazil. At its height, it had about 20,000 inhabitants and was ruled by an elected leader called the Ganga Zumba. Inhabitants of the Kingdom of Palmeiras included escaped slaves, native peoples who were native to the region of Quilombo, um, as well as some poor Portuguese who were trying to escape uh, marginalization in Portuguese society and forced military service. Like Nanny Town, the citizens of Palmeiras would raid plantations. Um, they also grew crops uh, to sustain the community. But one big difference was that when the Kingdom of Palmeiras would um, send people to raid plantations, when they captured slaves, so captured people who were enslaved, rather than freeing them, they actually uh, kept them in slavery to help grow crops. Now, the reason that Palmeiras was able to last as long as it did from 1630 to 1694 was likely largely due to its um, location. So it was located in a rugged region of King Lombo, which was largely inaccessible to Portuguese forces. It wasn't until 1694 when an army of Bandeirantes went into Quilombo that Palmeiras was ultimately defeated. Um, with the defeat of the Palmeiras military, we saw the end of that kingdom. Now, after the fall of Palmeiras, other Maroon communities developed within the region. And to this day, you have groups of people called Quilombolos who are descendants of Maroons who escaped into that region. The Maroon communities didn't just exist within South America and the Caribbean, they also existed within North America. One of the most famous ones is the Negro Fort in Florida. Between 1815 and 1816, about 800 African slaves, as well as 30 Choctaw natives, lived within a former British fort. The fort was abandoned by the British after the War of 1812 and was quickly uh, taken over by native peoples and again, escaped slaves from uh, American plantations um, within the region. Now, like Nanny Town and Palmeiras, um, the former slaves actually crossed from uh, Spanish-controlled Florida into the United States-controlled Georgia um, and raid plantations. And with those plantations, they would free uh, people who were enslaved there. The group was led by a black man named Garson, as well as a Choctaw chief. In 1816, General Andrew Jackson, who would become the seventh president of the United States, ordered the fort to be destroyed. He petitioned the Spanish governor of Florida to destroy the fort. At the same time, he ordered a major general to go in and destroy it with the help of the Creek native peoples. After a series of failures by American and Creek forces, um, the fort was ultimately destroyed when a shot um, hit a uh, gunpowder gunpowder magazine and exploded, destroying the fort. After the battle, Garson and the Choctaw chief were captured and handed over to the creek. Garson was shot uh, by the creek and the Choctaw chief was scalped. And while some survivors were handed over to the creek, others were re-enslaved into the United States. Now, the fourth king we want to talk about is the village of Ganvie in the nation of Benin. Now, technically, Ganvie was not established by escaped slaves. However, it was established by individuals who were trying to escape slavery. Let me explain. In the 18th century, members of the Tofanu tribe fled to Lake Nakwe in Benin to escape soldiers of the Dahomey and Fon kingdoms. 
A while ago, I did a review of the film, The Woman King. Within that film, you had the Agoji, who were soldiers of the Dahomey Kingdom. And so, yes, some of these women were the soldiers that the Tofunu were trying to escape from. And these women were trying to capture these individuals and sell them to slavery to the Portuguese. Now, one of the most interesting things about Ganvier is that the village is completely on the water. Um, the structures within the village are built up on mangrove stilts that extend out of Lake Nakwe. Now, estimates of the population of Ganvier uh, do vary. Um, I've seen around 10,000 one place. I've seen 20,000, I've seen 30,000. Though I think most people do agree that Ganvier is the largest uh, village that's on a river within Africa. Now, the last king I want to talk about is Yanga Kori in Benin and Sierra Leone. Now, like Ganvier, Yanga Kori was created by Africans who were trying to escape slavery within Africa. However, unlike Ganvier, the individuals who created Yanga Kori were already enslaved within Africa and escaped slavery um, to Yanga Kori. Now, Yanga Kori is a region that is on the border of modern day Guinea and Sierra Leone. The Yanga Kori rebellion started in 1783, where slaves in the region started to fight back against their African masters. Now, the rebellion was against the Kingdom of Moria. Now, Moria is modern day Guinea. Um, and so during an expedition, a military expedition from Guinea into uh, what's now Sierra Leone, the people within the Yanga Kori region started to fight back against their masters. Um, they killed many of their masters and beheaded them um, and started to fortify their towns. Now, one key difference between slavery in Africa and slavery within um, say the United States was that rather than being on plantations, a lot of these slaves were in these slave towns and they overwhelmingly outnumbered their masters. And so when these rebellions did happen, like we saw in Yanka Kori, um, they would be able to put up a pretty significant defense. The defense was so significant, it actually went on for 14 years. Now, one thing they did was actually align with a neighboring kingdom, the Sambuya, and was now Sierra Leone. Um, the Sambuya tolerated their presence because it weakened their uh, military rivals, the Maria. Um, and so not only did they um, provide safe haven for some of the rebels in Yankagori, uh, some of the Yankagori rebels actually joined, uh, some of them joined the Sambuya uh, military. Now, one problem, though, is that the Sambuya also held slaves. And so the increasing population of the Yankagori rebels started to include the Sambuya uh, escaped slaves. Now, one interesting fact is that um, the Yankagori, just like with the um, rebels in um, Jamaica and Negro Fort and Palmares, they would attack plantations um, that were close to them and they would actually take slaves. But more similar to Palmares, um, these slaves wouldn't necessarily be freed. In fact, with the Yankagori rebels, they would sometimes sell the slaves they captured um, as a way to make money for their community. Now, another similarity with Palmeiras that, you know, even though they would take and actually keep slaves, um, you know, within the community and also sell them, um, if you ran away and joined uh, the settlement, you were a free person. Now, the rebellion ended in 1796 when rulers in the surrounding kingdoms decided to ally themselves together. Now, historically, these different kingdoms were constantly at war. And so this is actually a pretty significant event. So they came together. Um, they first uh, tried to attack the settlements, which largely failed. Then they started to lay siege. And ultimately, they were able to defeat the um, Yanga Koi rebels when an American trader who had actually visited uh, the area provided information to the warlords who were trying to destroy the kingdom. Now, if you found this video interesting and or informative, please like this video, subscribe to my channel. Also, please share this video. And if there are other kingdoms created by African slaves that you want me to talk about, please include the suggestions in the comment section below. Thank you all for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day.